welcome again to our first EDUCAST, our VAVE EDUCAST, which are briefer educational webinars. So, so excited to have our first one back in 2023. And our lineup of people is amazing. So first off, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Saul Flores. So he's an associate professor of pediatrics in the divisions of critical care and cardiology at Baylor College of Medicine down there in Houston, Texas. Uh, Saul has a very cool background where his MD is actually from UMSA in La Paz, Bolivia. Then he came to Cook County up in Chicago for his residency program in pediatrics. And then we've got like three fellowships. You must have been a P in PGY status for a long time. So cardiology at Rainbow Babies and Children's, which is in Cleveland, and then cardiac critical care at Cincinnati Children's, and then critical care at Cincy Children's as well. And so we met. Um, it's so exciting to have you on on the the show with me because we just met um, a couple of weeks ago so we were both teaching at um dr neelam sony's ut san antonio he does this it's like the 15th year of point of care ultrasound course um this one was held in austin and y'all it was so cool because you were just going to have maybe like one table for kids and then all these pediatricians kept signing up and so i think you ended up with over 20 kids and at least five faculty right it was great well, thank you so much, Renee, for the invitation. It really is an honor to 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 share this little time with you. And and like you said, very excited to to be able to meet you. Those sessions are really, really fun. I, I think it's it's fascinating for me to see that a point of care ultrasound is just expanding in every single subspecialty in both adult and pediatric medicine. So like you said, yeah. you and I under other circumstances would not be able to meet other than our interest in, in, in POCUS. And that's exactly right. We, um, and Nilan and I partnered up to, to bring back some of the pediatric work a couple of years ago. And there were only a few pediatricians involved. And, you know, at that time we didn't have a need to have children, but then, uh, this year, you know, all of a sudden we had 24 learners and, uh, yeah, yeah people want up, their, that's People right. want their pediatric ultrasound. Yeah, that's 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 true, and so it's been fascinating to be able to to be on this side of the of the learning curve of ultrasound. So very cool. Well, we're so excited to have you as our our pediatric inspired. So we have um adult cardiac anesthesiology, quick care, um, and then we have our interventional cardiologist, and I'm very excited to have you representing the pediatricians of the world. Oh, that's exciting. Thank you. I mean, it, yeah, when you when you told me about this, I was all in and in part because I think um, obviously pediatric medicine always lags behind in terms of uh, introducing innovation into medicine. And I think POCUS is one of those examples. Uh, but I think we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel in that more subspecialties in PETS are starting to take it on the, the use of uh, of ultrasound and that's part of the reason how I put together the, this presentation in that we're going to talk a little bit about the the basics of of what a point of care ultrasound is specifically evaluating the cardiovascular function and uh, you know we'll sprinkle a case at the end uh, to Love get it. interest and kind of see how we utilize it all right excellent so the title of this talk like we said is going to be hard point of care ultrasound um, I do have a disclosure on the chair for the Society of Critical Care Medicine Pediatric and Neonatal Committee. And what it is, is uh, just, you know, being able to, to be at the forefront of uh, ultrasound education within the society uh, in the pediatric realm. Um, so with that, we're gonna talk about so, a heart ultrasound and, and heart focus specifically, and kind of like going over some of the benefits and trying to identify what the downsides of it are. And as you can see, I, I kind of put a laundry list of of potential benefits of, of hard focus. And it's really palpable, right? Like the fact that you can just roll in a machine and now even actually get a machine out of your pocket <laughs> and be able to take a look at someone's function. is just, you know, one of those fascinating things. Um, it's non-invasive, radiation free. You can do it as many times as necessary. Helps you with diagnosis and also assist with any potential procedures in, in your unit. Some of the down identified downsides of it are that there is a, a some dependency on the operator. There is a learning curve. 
And since it's a skill, there's pitfalls associated with it. But what is it about hard focus that we enjoy so much? Is the fact that it augments your traditional physical exam and improves your diagnostic accuracy when compared with physical exam and, and x-ray specifically. I, we kind of joke around that if uh, Re René Lenick uh, didn't invent the stethoscope and instead he would have invented the ultrasound, <laughs> we would all carry an ultrasound machine and not a stethoscope. So when it comes Thank to you. a cardiac focus, probe selection is important. As you know, we're going to have to use the phased array probe, which is a lower megahertz uh, a probe, but allows us to penetrate the chest and being able to capture the heart. In terms of the protocol that we follow, um, there's the famous windows that we're trying to paint a picture of. And that's what I tell the learners is that when you're capturing the heart, you really are trying to tell a story. And the reason we have four different uh, windows is because they are, they're going to give you different images depending on the on the patient's condition. So we have the personal long axis, the personal short axis, apical four chamber, and the subcostal or sub sub side foot uh, window. All of them, obviously from the heart, but just kind of like telling you different aspects of it. So how does that look like in a diagram? The way it does is, as you can see, the, the personal area is obviously gonna be right next to the, the sternum bone, sternal bone, uh, but the personal long axis is gonna be on someone whose heart is sitting, pointing towards the left, the notch is gonna go to the right shoulder. For external short, the notch is gonna be at the left shoulder. And uh, the apical four chamber, we're gonna slide that probe down to the to the uh, axillary area on the fifth, uh, fourth to fifth um, intercostal space. And the notch is gonna go to three o'clock. And then you're gonna do the same thing, notch at three o'clock for the subcostal. So you're gonna be capturing different areas of the heart that look a little bit different, right? So for instance, here, we're on the what it's called the, the per-sternal uh, long axis, and you can see the diagram coupled with the to the, to the image. But it's essentially what we're using this image for is to capture the RV, the LV, the left atrium, and part of the aorta. So I'm gonna show you a live video of that. And again, we do a quick assessment of the RV, LV, left atrium, mitral valve, and aorta. Every single time we're scanning someone's heart, we're thinking of three things. How's the function? So the qualitative assessment or eyeball method. Is there a pericardial effusion? And remember, fluid is heavier than air, so it's gonna go to gravity dependent areas. This is anterior, this is posterior. So you're gonna be looking for a rim of anechoic fluid, which is gonna be black in the back. And then question number three is, is there anything abnormal? So since you're going to be scanning a lot of hearts, you're going to be able to identify whether there's something additional in that image that you typically wouldn't expect. So those are the three key questions that we tell our learners when they're learning uh, how to do uh, cardiovascular as assessment in pediatrics. Moving on to the personal short image, like we said, we rotate the probe to, towards that left shoulder. We're going to be on that left personal area of the chest. And what you end up doing is, uh, or sorry, what, what you end up seeing is this short axis view of the LV. The LV in long axis kind of looks like a cone. When you do that orthogonal or perpendicular rotation of the probe into the left shoulder, then it becomes a circle. And this circle has to be a perfect circle because it provides so much uh, physiologic information if it's not a circle. So th the anatomy goes like this. So we're on top of the pie. So this is anterior, this is posterior. Left is on the right side of the screen and right is on the left side of the screen, a little bit confusing there. Nice. And uh, <laughs> and you can see the notch on the left side uh, or the marker on the left side of your screen. Here you see the inter the RV, top to bottom, a little bit of the free wall of the RV, the LV, the mitral valve, and then you see the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This is uh, followed by the, by the diagram next to it. I'm gonna show you a live clip of that. And again, we're look at trying to answer those three questions, right? Do I see all the segments of the, the LV contracting simultaneously? Question number one. So if you see that, you'll say yes. Do I see a rim of anechoic fluid in the most gravity dependent area of that particular window? In this case, it's no. And the, the, the third thing would be, do I see anything unusual for this particular image? And the answer to that question is no. But if you start seeing structures inside the LV or all of a sudden you're, the function is not looking great, 
then you will answer those questions um, according to that. So we have the personal along so far. We just did the personal short access. We're going to move on to the apical four chamber view. So in my world, I take care of critically ill people and I don't have the luxury to be able to position the patient. But in an adult sized patient where the chest wall and the lung volumes are larger, as we know, uh, air is not a good conductor of sound. So you have to use maneuvers to be able to expose the heart. One of them is put, placing the patient on a left lateral decubitus position, allowing the heart by weight and gravity get closer to the chest wall such that you can get a, get a, need, a good image. However, again, depending on your environment, you might not be able to do that. But having a general reference of how you're trying to penetrate the chest wall is always helpful. So you're going to be rotating the probe towards three o'clock. So the notch is going to be pointing down towards the bed. And then you're going to try to get in, into that intercostal space such that you can capture this image. And in this particular image, on the adult imaging, the the image show looks exactly how it is here, which is the ventricles are on, on the top of the image and the atrium are below. Not to confuse anybody, but on pediatric, on pediatric cardiology, that image gets flipped in that the atrium oh. end up above and the ventricles okay. end up below. But just to stay in the same nomenclature, I didn't flip the image. And the anatomy <laughs> that you check for would be on the right side of the screen, you have the LV, the left atrium, and then on the left side of the screen, you have the RV, the right atrium. One of the things that we point out uh, all the time when we're talking about this is the offset of the valves. And this is because the fibrous tissue that uh, the that generates the valves in uh, during development are uh, comes from different structures, and they are the tricuspid valve is a little bit lower of the uh, compared to the mitral valve, and that's due to a process of of um, delamination of those of those valves. In my world, that that becomes a very important aspect because there are certain conditions where the valve leaflets are at the exact same level. However, I do teach it in in our. Uh, regular pediatric focus course because I want people to be able to identify the RV regardless. And that's one of the things that we show people. Um, so now I'm going to show you a running clip of that. And as you remember the three questions that we said, how's the function? So does it look okay? Is there a fluid in the most gravity dependent area? And that would be around this area. Sometimes you have to move the probe just a tad so you can see a little more of the apex. And the third thing is do I see something unusual? And sometimes people comment on this little dot right outside the heart. This is the descending thoracic aorta wrapping around the heart. And you can see it's an extra cardiac structure outside the pericardial sac. So don't be uh, confused by thinking that could be something abnormal. That's actually completely normal. And our last and final window is the subcostal or subsifoid image. As you saw, we will slide from the apical four chamber view down to the, that subsifoid region. I love having this, I love scanning this image. I, because of my patient population, I tend to do it last because nobody is super excited about getting their tummy um, mm. pushed in <laughs> with a probe. But uh, the reason I like this image is because the liver provides such a beautiful contrast to be able to distinguish the organ. So you can see uh, the that the most inferior structures of the heart are gonna be that right atrium and the RV laying on top of that liver. Then right next to it, we have the left atrium and then we're gonna have the LV. Very similar images to the apical four chamber, but every single window has a very, very uh, key feature and we like to use it for specific things. So for instance, this is actually the best image for us to comment on the integrity of the atrial septum. So if you're looking for ASDs, atrial septal defects or PFOs, or maybe uh, uh, anomalous uh, pulmonary vein drainage, this is the image that we're gonna be looking for, okay? And here, I'm gonna show you a running clip of that. So. How's the function? Is there any effusion? Is there anything else abnormal? One of the things that comes up for this image from this image and that we use a lot is the fact that it allows you to understand that the most posterior inferior structure of the heart is actually the right atrium. And this tends to be an area uh, that tends to collect fluid early on in cases of myopericarditis or pericarditis. So we use this image to tell us there's a little bit of effusion. This is a patient that we're going to have to pay a little extra attention. And in this particular clip that I'm sharing with you guys, you can also see the pulmonary veins draining into that left atrium. And you kind of see the structure right there. So you can see a right pulmonary vein and then your left pulmonary vein. And you can't really comment on four veins, but it kind of gives you a general idea of some of that venous return into, into the heart. Okay, so we're done with the windows. 
we're going to move on to the transducer movement called the sweep. And it's just a translational movement of the transducer, right? So if you're talking to the dean of the med school who happens to be a cardiologist and loves echo, you, you're going to tell them that it's the translational movement of the transducer. But when you're teaching this, most people will say this is a sweep. And the sweep allows you to see different areas within each window. So in summary, you can assess the normal anatomy of the heart. You're going to check for function. And then you have the different categories of this function. And then you can also identify abnormal things like pericardial effusions and start connecting those dots with some of the physiology. So for instance, let me show you a normal heart. So personal short axis at the level of the popular, uh, sorry, at the level of the mitral valve, you can see that the every single segment of the heart seems to be squeezing uh, in synchrony. And then you see the round nature of the interventricular septum. I, um, I told you that this is a very important physiologic principle because what it's really telling you is that this interventricular septum, think of it as a, a wall with your neighbor. If, your na if you have a rowdy oh, neighbor, God. meaning the right ventricle, and it's a, under a lot of pressure or volume, it's going to put pressure onto the LV. So that perfect roundness of it goes away and it becomes flat. Uh, flat finding of the interventricular septum is never normal. So then that will lead to all kinds of investigations just to make sure whether your patient has pulmonary hypertension. So if it's a pressure overload or has some sort of shunting lesion that would cause uh, volume overload or whether your patient has some sort of heart failure that is overloading that RV and just causing issues onto, onto the LV. Because remember, you if you decrease the size of the LV, then you, your stroke volume goes down and eventually your cardiac output could be compromised. Okay? So I'm going to show you some examples where the ventricular function is not as neat. Now you can see that that interventricular septum went from round to flat. And then you can see that the longitudinal function of that LV in the personal long axis doesn't look as crisp as we saw. So the three questions, we said, how does the function look? Is there any pericardial fusion, anything abnormal? And you can see that by answering those questions, you can say, well, there's ventricular dysfunction here. So that's mild to moderate. How does severe ventricular dysfunction look like? It looks like that. So you can distinguish the anatomy. Right, you can still go systematically to, through your uh, anatomic findings. So you're going to comment on the RV, slightly dilated. You're going to comment on the interventricular septum, not a whole lot of movement there. You're going to look at the LV cavity, and you're going to look at the contractility of the muscle. And then you can clearly see that there's very little movement. And you can do that on the apical four chamber as well. All right. Then now you have a brand new skill, and now you can use it to comment on the function, but also now. Check this out. This is the, the what I was telling you, that anechoic rim of fluid, right? So fluid in ultrasound is going to be black. And you can see that there's a space between the pericardial sac and the chest wall, both in the peristernal short and peristernal long axis. And sometimes if you don't keep an eye out on those guys, it can get, it can get really prominent. And here you can see all kinds of really cool pieces of information. So you can see that the fluid has accumulated and it's completely circumferential. And now the, this fluid has also created a pressure overload, impinging, encroaching into the RV cavity size. And so you can see some collapse of, uh, of that RV free wall. I know we say that the, the definition of cardiac tamponade should be clinical with pulses paradoxes increment. However, if you have images like this really help out, uh, bring you know to attention uh, a, a key problem and plan it out accordingly. Similarly, you can comment on the on the function of the RV. This is more of an advanced thing, but just laying your eye, eyes and kind of like keeping tabs on how the RV is functioning, the size of the RV. That's one of the things that we tell learners all the time, which is keep an eye out on the RV. The RV, I think, doesn't get enough love and, and understanding, <laughs> but often the RV can be a harbinger of I issues. I get that. Could you try again? <laughs> Siri also agrees. <laughs> no, she is very interested in this too. She's probably heard me talk about ultrasound a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so keep an eye out on that RV. So this is uh, a case that I took care of it. Uh, not from the beginning, but I was a recipient. So here it goes. Um, so 
This is a two-year-old previously healthy female. She was transferred from outside hospital. She had four days of fever, Tmax of 103. She had a rash, one day swelling of hands and feet, some uh, conjunctival injection, some eye pain. She had an episode of emesis, and, uh, no diarrhea. She did have decreased PO intake. However, she had a normal urine output and partly because her mouth was sore. She had seen her pediatrician three days prior to uh, coming to, to our hospital and she was diagnosed with strep pharyngitis and placed on amoxicillin. Mom had tested positive for COVID uh, a couple months prior. Uh, on her initial presentation, she had uh, some abnormal labs. Uh, she had uh, 10.8 WBCs, her CRP was high. Procalcitonin was increasing, but not crazy high for you know, pediatric standards. Ferritin was slightly elevated, so was her fibrinogen. Her BMP was 398 for uh, reference purposes on pediatrics, less than 50 would be normal. Proponin was slightly Chem elevated, and her Chem 10 and all, uh, UA and liver enzymes were normal. Initial focus on the ED disclosed that mildly dilated RV, mildly decreased LV function, no pericardial effusion. There wasn't anything abnormal on that initial image on the personal long axis. And you can see on the apical four chamber view, you can see slightly offset size of the LV compared to the RV. This is a live image from this child. So you can see that she was trying to run away from the probe and that's very <laughs> expected. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, and you can see that this is an in-between image in that we're opening up the uh, from the apical four chamber view into that five chamber view. Uh, but commenting on the three things we talked about, right? So the eyeball method for the, or qualitative assessment of the function, whether we can see any fluid or anything abnormal. And we have a personal short axis view and you can see decreased contractility of that LV, no pericardial effusion and nothing unusual besides that. And lastly, our subcostal image that shows collapsibility of the inferior vena cava. You can see the right atrium, the tricuspid valve. And remember, I told you that was the most gravity dependent area of the heart. So if I'm seeing pericardial effusion, that would be the area that, that we would see it. So in summary, uh, a mild to moderate uh, a biventricular dysfunction, mild to moderate uh, LV and RV dilation, and then good collapsibility of the inferior vena cava. I know we haven't talked about the collapsibility, but you wanna be able to make sure that your vascular structures are behaving accordingly. So we'd be looking for a completely collapsed vein on someone who is completely dehydrated and very preload dependent, or we would be looking at a vein that is completely distended um, in a patient that has heart failure kind of thing. So in this case, it's behaving normally. So, because of this findings of subcostal dysfunction and the clinical picture, it raises all kinds of, of uh, flags at Texas Children's and obviously at the wake of the, of the pandemic. So this is an automatic phone call to cardiology, rheumatology, and ID. And with those findings, this child will start uh, uh, steroid therapy and will be um, automatically admitted to the cardiac intensive care unit. Our institutional experience has been that some of these patients, about 15 to 10, uh, 15 to 20 percent, will develop severe ventricular dysfunction and the possibility of mechanical support. So for that reason, they get transferred to the CICU. So I'm the recipient of the child. Uh, so since uh, her arrival at uh, the ED, she had defervesced somewhat. Her temperature now is down to 100.9. She remains agitated and tachycardic. Some lab work, repeated lab work that we sent uh, shows that she's COVID positive. Her troponin uh, went from 0 0.056 up to 0 0.075. Her BMP went from the 700 range up to the 1200 range. And now her WBCs, which were initially 10,000 up, are up to 27,000. Her CRP is up to 17.4 uh, and her ferritin also triple, which is automatic diagnosis of MISC for us. And this leads to very specific therapy. The ICU POCUS shows that this is after a single dose of steroids, the ventricular dysfunction. So mildly dilated RV, mildly dil dilated LV. Uh, you can see now a little rim of pericardial effusion on that particular view, but not it's not something that, you know, I, I kind of had to squint my eyes a little bit and try to see it. Then we rotated the probe to that left shoulder. We are looking at the personal short axis. We see a perfect round circle. 
we see both papillary muscles. I'm looking at the RV and I can see a little rim of pericardial effusion, but nothing that would have been like, oh my goodness. But then kid got fussy and, but I was able to scan here subcostal area. And now here is very clear pericardial effusion, right? So with ventricular dysfunction and myopericarditis, this is a patient that will get the full therapy for MISC at our institution. But on top of that, we had a little extra finding on her. So this is the personal short axis. We had, we did the sweep all the way to the base of the heart. So we went cranial from that personal short image. And this is the Mercedes vein sign. And I went a little bit higher up just to show the coronaries. So we said that this is the left side of the screen. This is the right side of the screen. And you can see the left main coronary artery. You can see the left circumflex and you can see the bifurcation to the LED. These are very hard images to obtain. But this particular child, it was no effort. So this raises yet another uh, flag on a patient like this because coronary inflammation is the hallmark of MISC. So again, this will you know predispose us to, to treat this patient more way more aggressively. On the counter lateral side, we uh, we also see very prominent coronary arteries. So here we can see that if you come off axis, so you're still on that personal long, uh, personal short axis view, you slide your probe up a little bit higher onto the aorta, you lose the leaflets. However, you open up the coronary arteries, you can see the complete anatomy of the left side of the coronary system with the left main, the circumflex, and the bifurcation into the LAD. This is the one image that a pediatric cardiology will use to make the diagnosis of uh, potential coronary ectasia, aneurysms, and clot formation in MISC. Those are wild, wild pictures. And and just for those of us who take care of old people or people over 18, would you mind um, uh, spelling out that abbreviation for me just because I'm a little rusty at my piece? <laughs> <laughs> of course. So MISC stands for the Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome in Children. And this was... Um, Consider at the very beginning of the pandemic, very similar to what Kawasaki syndrome would be to any viral process in that you get a lot of inflammation, including of the of um, vasculitis of mid-sized caliber vessels. Um, so we identify it uh, in, in uh, COVID-19 infections. And now we have enough data points to be able to distinguish uh, some of the features between MISC and Kawasaki syndrome. So anyways, with, with those findings, we have a child in the ICU with very clear signs of inflammatory markers. We have ventricular dysfunction now with a pericardial effusion that is clear right behind the right atrium. In addition to that, uh, coronary ectasia and dilation. So that at, uh, at my current institution will make this patient a candidate for the, the complete therapy of MISC, wow. which is comprised of IVIG, uh, yeah, solumedrol and transition to prednisolone, anakinra, PPI, anticoagulation, both with uh, uh, with aspirin and uh, heparin. And uh, in this particular patient, four days after admission and um, initiation of therapy, her troponin um, went back to almost normal levels as the, and the BMP almost completely clear. So in conclusion, cardiac so focus helps us evaluate patients at higher risk of cardiac dysfunction. Uh, to perform focus as often as necessary for cardiac evaluation, it's one of those uh, procedures that we do that has very, very little complications. Uh, it does not produce any radiation. It allows you to uh, determine the myocardial function and presence of uh, pericardial effusion. And it also, a little more advanced, allows you to pay attention to structures that are not normal, such as uh, coronary dilation, uh, to be able to call your consultants uh, more uh, rapid. And uh, early diagnosis leads to early treatment, and that leads to improved outcomes. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And Renee, thank you so much for this invitation. Yeah, goodness, that was so fascinating. Um, I'm always wowed by... Um, the, when, when I get to go teach and scan children, it's, it's fascinating. You can see so much at once, but then also they're moving, like you mentioned. 
um, and just the the full case. Uh, I've only ever seen Anna Kinder given in like gout for old people. So um, yeah. just, yeah, super, super fascinating and, and great overview. So this is the perfect, perfect um, lead off. And so next we're going to kick it over and we're going to meet Dr. Nick Ravon. And then later on, we're going to meet Dr. Hayter. So really appreciate your time and teaching here. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. So excited to lead us off with Dr. Sara Nikravan. So we first met at AIUM in probably like 2015. I don't know, a long, long time ago. A long ago. time ago, yeah. Um, so she's <laughs> been incredibly active in the point of care ultrasound world. She completed her medical school at uh, Texas Tech and then did residency at Washington University, followed by Stanford Critical Care Fellowship. And then that wasn't quite enough training. So she went ahead and did <laughs> CT anesthesiology fellowship as well. And now she's up at University of Washington, just north of me here, where she's been since 2020. She is um, an associate professor of anesthesiology and pain medicine. And I learned this while uh, stalking you on the interwebs before this, <laughs> that you are the associate program director or one of the associate program directors for the anesthesiology uh, residency program, in addition to the director of curriculum for the residency, and finally, the director of point of care ultrasound. So as if all of that isn't enough. She is also very active nationally and internationally. So I wrote it down here. So you are the former chair of the ultrasound committee and the ultrasound courses for SCCM, in addition to coming up with the and, and helping to run and lead the Crick Care Echo preparation course for SCCM and ASE together. Did I get that right? It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it's the uh, AS, uh, ASE and SCCM Critical Care Echocardiography Board Review course. I definitely did not help create it, but I helped. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was part of the first crew when we had no idea what was going to be on the test. So yeah. Got it. And been, been working with them for the last couple of years as well. Wonderful. Well, so all of that goes to show you are truly an expert on the heart. And I'm really <laughs> thankful that you've um, taken the time with me today. So a lot of, there's a lot of great excitement around point of care ultrasound, and there's still a lot of folks that are pre-contemplative or contemplative. So I really appreciate you taking off that super expert hat and sharing a couple of cases that really show the utility um, in, in very focused cardiac ultrasound. So I will let you take it away. Excited to hear from you. Well, I'm super excited too. I think um, uh, when we were first chatting, we were chatting about, you know, um, how can you use point of care ultrasound and in, in particular focus cardiac ultrasound in patients who are unstable, right? You know, when you have a, a question that you really need answers to and answers to quickly. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. This is a Valentine's Day special. So we're going to talk beautiful. about the heart. <laughs> Don't you love and it? And also that background is almost like waves, like ultrasound yeah, waves. So like this, ultrasound is, waves. <laughs> this is crazy cool. This is whole next level background, right? Indeed. <laughs> this is great. So um, basically, I wanted to share with you all a case that, that we had of a female who was 72 years old. Um, she had presented for a lithotripsy um, and had had obstructive ne nephropathy from a kidney stone. And after she was induced, she became profoundly hypotensive and really and almost coded really hypotensive. And so, you know, the question that you're asking yourself in a situation like this is why? I mean, there are so many reasons, right? She's we just induced her with anesthesia. She could have you know been affected by our agents. Um, she could have some sort of septic phenomenon. She could have a cardiac issue that had been undiagnosed because she's elderly patient um, with comorbidities maybe that had not been totally sussed out. So um, we put on an ultrasound probe on her and this is, you know, this is real life. So, you know, excuse that it's not a perfect image, but this is a parasternal short access at the level of the papillary muscles. I'm hoping you can see my arrow here. Here's the left yep. ventricle. And then the papillaries pop into view when she takes a breath. And then you can see the right ventricle there on top. And so, you know, when you see kind of like a heart like this, oftentimes people will say, 
the patient's empty, right? She's tachycardic. She's 126 beats per minute. She's empty. She needs fluid. Okay. And the reason why I wanted to kind of share this case is that's not the wrong answer for sure. But when a heart is hyperdynamic, which is what we say this is, and when we say hyperdynamic, that means complete cavity obliteration um, in systole. Um, you, it can be for a couple of different reasons, right? Maybe it's that their preload is low and there are in quotes empty, but there are other etiologies that could explain that. So, you know, you give this patient fluid and maybe her heart rate slows down to 104 beats per minute, but she's still hyperdynamic. So why is that? You know, and this is kind of where we've gotten ourselves into trouble with pounding people with fluid um, without really having some other, you know, end marker assessments or fluid tolerance assessments, basically. So if a patient is hyperdynamic, it could be because they're empty and they need more fluid, but there are other etiologies. For example, anything that causes a distributive phenomenon, right? So if her SVR is low because of sepsis, or her SVR is slow because of, or low because of the anesthetics, or, you know, what if you have a patient who has an anaphylactic reaction, right? Um, that can give you a low SVR and the, and the heart will be very hyperdynamic in patients like that. And oftentimes that's a combination of needing fluids and vasopressors. Um, what if they have um, liver failure? right? And they're, they have a low SVR because of that. So there's lots of reasons. So I guess my pro tip uh, for this case is if you see an LV and an RV that are hyperdynamic, it doesn't always equal hypovolemia. So I'm not saying don't give the patients fluid. I'm just saying think about it a little bit. Yeah. So that's the first case. 100%. Um, and then the other the other case I wanted to share with you um, is one that I think has several. It's like uh, if I could put a stool in the middle of a room and stand on it and like <laughs> preach, this would be that case. So um, I have this patient um, coded in the operating room. Okay, forty two year old female, history of tobacco use and breast cancer. Had had a right mastectomy in the past and was presenting for a left upper lobe wedge resection, and she coded shortly after induction. So another utility of ultrasound is not just in the patient that becomes hypotensive, but you can incorporate it into a patient who was arrested and mm -hmm. to understand exactly what the etiology of the arrest was or could be. So. My uh, the resident that I was working with got this clip of the patient's IVC, and you can see this IVC is really large, it's big, um, and the thing I always hear is, "It's heart failure." The IVC is big; it's yeah. heart failure, and so the you know um, pro, second pro tip of the day is a big IVC could mean so many things. So don't ever just look at the IVC in exclusion of the rest of the cardiac exam and make a decision ever. Like, this is a terrible idea because what if your patient had bit? Giving you an extra heart for this one. I could <laughs> not agree more. <laughs> what if they had tamponade, right? You can see this is a subcostal four chamber wow. view. The heart is surrounded by fluid. The, all, the RV is almost completely compressed. I mean, in diastole, but even in systole, it, it looks terrible. Patients like this can have a dilated IVC. And I kind of jokingly tell my residents when I'm working with them, if you diuresed a patient with tamponade, you might as well just sign over your medical license, hand it to the attorneys, and go buy yourself an ice cream truck because <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's it. You know, that would be a terrible event. So what if the patient had something like this? So you can see the RV is completely blown out. You see the right atrium is giant. There's a huge clot in the right atrium kind of lopping in and out of the right ventricle. And you can see the patient has these signs of acute right ventricular strain because the lateral free wall is pretty hypokinetic, but look how the apex is spared and how it's moving down and up mm -hmm. kind of robustly. We call this the McConnell sign a sign of acute RV strain. 
So they, this might be a reason why their IVC is dilated, right? Or what about this? Which is what most people would suspect when they see an IVC. Yes. Yeah, is that, it, oh, it's, it's heart failure, right? Biventricular heart failure. Um, the patient needs to be diary. Sure, if you got if you got that image and this image too, um, or what if the patient had coded and this is what you saw, a right heart that was really actually thick. You know, you can see in a subcostal four chamber image that mm -hmm. RV wall looks thick. You know, the right atrium is really big, so signs of chronic disease. And now the RV has failed. So maybe this patient had pulmonary hypertension at baseline with a big, you know, with a hypertrophied RV. And then we induced them. The patient got hypoxic and hypercarbic and ban had core pulmonale and arrested. So um, that is, and this is kind of the third pro tip that I wanted to give you, um, not really related to the IVC, but in the subcostal four chamber image, when you have a normal image like this one that's really nice and opened up, the RV should be um, underestimated. It should look really small, like a sliver. So if you have a nice opened up four chamber image in the subcostal uh, view and you have an RV that's really big like this, you have to be super suspicious and worried that there is RV dysfunction. So I um, just wanted to kind of compare the two. And that's my, my third okay. pro tip of the podcast. <laughs> um, and I think that, I that those it. are the cases that I had to share. Those are, are wonderful. I remember um, it's kind of burned into my brain, Dr. Bruce Kimura saying sub subcostal or sub xiphoid view is not at all sensitive for right heart enlargement, but it's super specific. If you see it, that ain't right. And that yes. was um, always burned into my brain. And then the other part regarding the IVC, I'm constantly grilling my students or pounding this into their brains. We're trying to get an assessment of right atrial pressure. It has nothing to do with volume. It has nothing to do with fluids. And also, I never let anyone make a call on volume status without also looking at the lungs and everything else. Unless yes. you are, um, you know, there's a lot of fancier stuff you can do and other people can do, but I'm... I believe all my students, I really would love for every clinician, every student to come out as these like pluripotent pocus stem cells and <laughs> they go on to obstetrics and they get really darn good at babies. They go on to anesthesia, anesthesia, cardiac anesthesia. They get really great at all of the, so, you know, our pulmonary artery acceleration time and all of the high level stuff, um, cardiology, same, um, but everyone, the very quick and dirty pericardial effusion, big RV, all of those things are so, so useful. So I guess my last, um, that was amazing. Perfect overview. The, the goal is we always like, I like to make it, um, you know, adult learning theory, little like bite-sized nuggets of information, but let's say somebody mid-career quick care anesthesia that didn't get the training, what would be your kind of most high yield tip for how to practice or learn? You know, to be very honest, I know that we have a very um, fast paced sort of a practice, um, but it would really be to just, you know, someone said to me, what is, um, how do you get started doing point of care ultrasound? Mm -hmm. And I said, you just get started. Like yeah. you just have to do it. You know, and what I mean by that is, um, is you pick your patient. Maybe you have a patient in the, your first start of the day that you're not pressured by the case before. You can come in a little bit earlier and mm -hmm. just talk to them and say, hey, you know, I'm learning how to do this um, really important thing, you know, that we have to do during really emergent situations. And we don't want to be learning how to do that in an emergency. So I was wondering if you would let me just scan your heart. And then you get some practice of doing normal. And patients are usually very... I mean, they're so kind and wonderful. Um, so that would be another scenario where you could just do that for your first start cases. Or maybe if you had a patient who had a delay to get started, their case was delayed, you could mm -hmm. scan them and chat with them. Um, you could um, scan your patients in the operating room 
for example, let's say you were doing a case where they were, um, you were doing like knees or hips or something that was a low from the chest and the patient was starting to get a little hypotensive and you were treating it, but you could always take a look with an ultrasound in the patient because you have access to their chest. You may not be able to get all the views, but you could get some of them. And that is a really good place to start. And so that, you know, things like that, if you're doing regional blocks on patients, you'd ask them, hey, can I also scan your heart while I have this ultrasound machine here sure. to do this block? Um, and they're they're pretty great. So that's that's one way that I would get started on just non-pathologic scanning so that by the time you get to pathology, like your patient's hypotensive in the PACU or something happens in the OR, you have a little bit more um, confidence in doing the scan. And I agree, if they're bored and they're nervous, I mean, who doesn't want to have more face-to-face time with their doctor? And again, that you have to be okay saying, I don't know, I'm practicing, I'm learning. But patients usually love the authenticity of that. Like we're all yes. lifelong learners. Um, and so I've never had a patient, I mean, I've had them say, no, I'm eating my lunch or no, I'm tired, <laughs> go away. But I've never had them say, I don't want you to practice on me because you don't know what you're doing. Thank you so much for your time. I loved your cases. And again, my goal is just to get people thinking, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so getting more and more people thinking about what we can be doing. And so Um, Yeah, really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for this opportunity. It was really fun. And happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Yes. So uh, thanks again for joining us. Super excited for our next all-star guest. Uh, I am very pleased to have Dr. Ali Hader here. So he currently is at New York Presbyterian Queens. He's an assistant professor of medicine and is board certified in like 42 things, but um, specifically including interventional cardiology, vascular medicine, and endovascular medicine, plus some other fun stuff. Um, So he actually did his uh, medical school, Albert Einstein. I should have asked you. We should play the name game later to see if you know my other friends that have gone there. Um, And then did internship and residency there at Montefiore, uh, Montefiore, Albert Einstein. Um, Then cardiology fellowship at Northwell, North Shore LIJ, and then back into the city for interventional cardiology fellowship at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell, where we also have some great POCUS friends, the HM POCUS group there. Shout out to y'all. And finally, uh, you're a fellow of American Cardiology. College of Cardiology, and I would say uh, prolific on social media as at your heart doc. And so we're super excited to have you here today. Thanks for for joining me. Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me over. Glad to be here. So something that we've been chatting about Mm -hmm. is um, uh, a lot of the limitations to ultrasound and use. Well, I guess there's there's many limitations. previous needs assessments would say, okay, we don't have enough equipment or equipment's too expensive. We don't have trained teachers and we don't have the education to know what to do with it. And so as the price points are coming down and ultra portable ultrasound is becoming more accessible, my goal is to uh, chat with people like you to try to plant seeds in people's brains. Let's say they're pre-contemplative. Let's give them some ideas of things that we could assess with point of care ultrasound. Of course, knowing you need training, but I would love to give them some ideas. Yeah. So as you pointed out, there's so much added information and value we can get from portable ultrasound. Of course, we um, we have to make sure people are trained properly and know how to interpret the information. But it's sort of no different than when you're learning how to do a physical exam properly in medical school, learning how to use your stethoscope. You know, um, now we just have fancier devices. And um, as the times are progressing, we just all need to know how to harness it, where we used to think that, you know, ultrasound or echocardiography is specific to, you know, non-basic cardiology. At one time that was, but the added of this portability aspect of it um, I think it's really going to be more applicable to a broader range of books as it already has. Um, and, you know, again, there's plenty of examples I can give you how I find um, the portable ultrasound to be valuable. But, you know, since I'm interventional, we'll, we'll go down that route and give you some senses and ideas um, where it could be helpful. So in a post-MI patient, we can talk about that. You know, someone like you mentioned, I've put some stents in somebody who come in and had a major heart attack. Um, 
And, you know, they're sitting and being monitored in, you know, the CC or ICU or depending on your hospital system, wherever that may be. And remember, every hospital is different. There's major academic centers and then you have more rural centers and we may be treating people, you know, we still treat patients with thrombolytics out in some places and stents. And not every hospital has the full breadth of capabilities and 24-7 access to, um, you know, um, um, care to, to, um, to offer these patients. So, um, you know, from the interventional cardiology standpoint, people who have heart attacks, we worry about them having problems in the next 48 hours, for example, right? So what, what do we worry about that can happen to these people? Um, well, they can have shock, they can get sick, they can have low blood pressure because of the heart attack and the weak heart muscle, right? Um, you know, in different types of heart attacks, they can also have um, right ventricular problems, for example. You're, you have an inferior wall MI, your right coronary was out, and then later you develop shock because you're RV. Okay. Um, then you have more sort of complex situations, scarier situations, such as post uh, MI mechanical complications, right? These patients can develop, um, you know, free wall ruptures, which if they survive that, they may have a giant bloody pericardial effusion that requires mm -hmm. surgery. Patients can develop um, ischemic mitral regurgitation or rupture of papillary muscle. People can develop a VSD defect. And these are all things that we do see and it, it still happens. But you know, when if this is happening in the middle of the night or this is happening somewhere where you um, don't have immediate access, whether it's from the type of hospital you're in or staffing shortages, you know, acquiring that information can be a challenge, right? And these are patients that we're talking about patients that get sick very quickly, right? Rather than dwindling sickness, they are fine and suddenly something bad happens. And trying to figure out what is happening to that patient is really important to, you know, go down the right treatment pathway, okay? And you know, normally we would think, okay, we do a physical exam of the patient, let's order some labs and let's order a stat echo to try to assess why that patient is suddenly getting sick. But, you know, realistically speaking, how fast can that happen? And if it takes yeah. how stat two, is three, stat? <laughs> two, three hours to get an echo and a patient has, if you're a watcher, that patient's dead. Or if a patient has tamponade or that patient has, um, you know, ruptured papillary muscle. If you don't do things, you know, um, in a quick fashion, some of these patients, bad things can happen. So enter the portable ultrasound realm, right? Now, um, certainly when we go to the bedside of a patient who is quite sick, we're gonna put our stethoscope on them. We're gonna listen to their lungs, we're gonna listen to their heart, that gives us information. But now, in addition to that, what if we were able to have an ultrasound that we were able to also do an assessment? And you don't necessarily have to be a cardiologist, you just have to be trained in the basics and understanding uh, anatomy and ultrasound um, and how to do it uh, on these patients. And you may be able to figure out what is going on, right? So, for example, patient crashes, right? All these things I just listed to you uh, on a post in my patient or on the differential, right? If we take an ultrasound probe, we put the, we do a subcostal view, we can immediately figure out. And one of the easiest things to do an ultrasound to learn is pericardial effusion, right? So that's mm -hmm. low hanging fruit. I tell folks they're starting out, learn how to understand if there's a pericardial effusion or not. But that gives you a lot of information. You've already ruled out one entire uh, handful of entire diagnoses. Um, and that's um, pretty easy to figure out, right? Um, now, a little bit more advanced stuff. Um, you can also try to figure out what the LV and the RV look like, right? That patient's in some sort of shock. They just had an MI. Can we see that the RV is moving well? Can we see that the LV is moving well or not? That'll give us a sense, hey, could there be something going on um, you know, and those things are treated differently, right? If you have RV shock versus LV shock. So if you can get a basic understanding of what something should look like and when something's wrong, um, that can also help you figure out. And similarly, that patient could have something more serious like a papillary muscle rupture or a VSD. These are the two mechanical complications that I had mentioned to earlier. Now, we have our handy dandy stethoscope, right? And this is where I always tell people, the stethoscope plus the ultrasound probe together are very powerful, right? So we can listen to the patient and maybe they have a rip roaring murmur, right? That's typically what you hear with the VSD, right? Now, if I hear that, then I know, you know what? This is what I'm I'm suspicious of. Let me go hunting for that, right? So then you can, you, you're at the bedside, you figure out what's going on with that patient. Then you can try to grab your probe and try to see if you can find uh, a defect somewhere, for example. Now, this is a little bit more advanced stuff, but like I said, this is trainable and this is things that, you know, folks who are interested in it, um, one day I think we'll be able to do. Um, similarly, what if your mitral valve is blown and you have a pap muscle rupture? If you know what a mitral valve should look like on, on the basics of an ultrasound, you can try to figure out when it's abnormal. Now, we're not expecting folks to be cardiologists here, right? 
all that information I just uh, gave you, you but the idea is to just try to understand what you know what the basics are and try to ascertain that information. And remember, with this technology, you can always send that images to the cardiologist. You could actually have a conversation with them. And I've done that, right? Mm -hmm. Say, hey, get the images for me. I'm not necessarily, if you could tell me there's no effusion, great. Get a couple images and let's talk about it together. Now we have these, you know, all these ultrasound probes have the capability of being able to share images and that adds value to it as well. So, you know, and, and you can get this information in the amount of time it would take to probably get someone on the phone to even call them to get an echocardiogram done. Right. Um, and, you know, in the in the severely crashing patient, you know, you may not have time to do much. You have to do something quickly, particularly if you have a tamponade or you have some, um, you know, crashing and burning patient that you have to do something to immediately or get a diagnosis that you can call someone um, without that delayed um, period of time. So, like I said, there is the, it sounds like, wow, this is a lot of stuff I have to kind of learn and understand. But really. We all, all cardiologists, we were all fellows once, we all trained. Um, and it, if you're interested in it and the training is appropriate, you can learn how to do that too. And like I said, this is, um, it, it's just going to add value. And this is where I think things are heading down the line. I love it. To me, when I'm teaching people that maybe are less familiar with point of care ultrasound, whether they're uh, other business people or um, maybe a, a late career internist, I say the secret sauce, the secret sauce of, of point of care ultrasound is you are the clinician at the bedside already. You already have a differential diagnosis. You're hypothesis yep. testing. You're not going there to do a comprehensive echo, including you right. know, your color, continuous wave Doppler, et cetera. You are hypothesis testing in a more of a binary yes, no decision making to help narrow that differential diagnosis, regardless of your setting, the, the ivory tower of academia, or e even if I wanted to get an, an urgent echo overnight, a stat echo, the, the most is a hospitalist. The earliest I would get, it would be the next day. Of course, I could transfer to the ICU, but uh, I just think uh, the more information you have, the, the better. And yep. so part of this was to kind of inspire people like, okay, these things are doable. These are, these are doable things that I can go to a course and practice. My favorite thing is when a patient's already had an echo, I yep. will then go and do my focus cardiac ultrasound and see what I think, and then go back and look at that echo report. And, right. uh, you know, they have a CT scan, that comments on certain anatomic, you know, maybe a CT comments on like a huge aorta. Okay, let's go ultrasound that abdominal aorta. So I'm learning as I'm going. Right. And so, uh, right. yeah. And like you said, practice is important. So when you go to a course, several courses or however the training is, you know, every patient has a heart. So you can always take a look at it. And I tell people, one of the most important things is you just understand when I have a good image, when I don't have a good image, right? I mean, that's yes. the biggest criticism you hear is like, oh, they did this ultrasound, they said X, Y, and Z, or they said we didn't see X, Y, and Z, but the images are crap. Well, that's part of the training. You just got to understand, mm -hmm. okay, I can I can ascertain information from this image or I cannot, right? I, I really do think it's, you know, there is no standardization of how we're training focused ultrasound, right? So that's that's the real issue. And you hear a lot of naysayers, you know, especially in cardiology saying, oh, you know, <laughs> like they should not be doing ultrasound. They don't know what they're looking at, da, 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 da. And, you know, it's coming from some anecdotes that may be true, but that does not mean that cannot be, um, that gap can't be closed. And, you know, um, look, this is like people say, this is the future. I mean, um, folks in medical school are learning this and we just have to frame it properly. I think, um, you know, I think every, I think most clinicians, certainly in people who work in the hospital, this is going to be, um, this is going to add value. You just have to understand it and, you know, be excited about it, like you said. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us. Really love hearing. Um, so we have our, again, our cardiac anesthesiologist, our uh, interventional cardiologist, and we have our pediatrician, our pediatric critical care cardiology, cardiologist. So um, an awesome Great. team here. And I uh, really appreciate your time. Yep, no worries. Thanks for having me. Okay, so hope you enjoyed that EDUCAST, the VAVE EDUCAST or educational webinar. Uh, we are here with Dr. Hader and very excited for our exciting giveaway. So what we've decided to do is we're going to do a giveaway for a three-year subscription. So probe, warranty, software, all the goods for three years to some lucky winner 
We're going to have a link um, in the show notes and also there'll be some social media posts. And so in two weeks on February 28th, we will do a drawing to see who is the winner of this three-year subscription. Very excited to um, get more ultrasounds out, out into the community and out to people that maybe are contemplative. I don't know if you have any comments on on uh, just the the value or the excitement of, of getting to try something for free. It's a... Uh, it's cool. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. I think this this is a great um, uh, opportunity for someone to get their hands on a, uh, a probe, um, especially folks who are maybe in training and are excited about it. Uh, and, you know, I think this is great. You guys are doing this. And I'm excited to be a part of it. All right. Well, we will see you all in two weeks.